Hello, you're with News Click and Leftward Books. This is a series called Talking About Marx's Political Texts with Ejaz Ahmed. Today, we're going to talk not about a whole text, but about what appears in the German ideology published, well, published in 1932 first, but written between 1845 and 1846. The first part of the text which appears as it did in, in 1932 is on Feuerbach. And that's the section we're going to talk about today. Ajaz, welcome to this great series. Thank you very much for initiating it. Well, this is an interesting text. It was published first in 1932. Marx and Engels put this together a year into their friendship. I mean, they meet in August 1844. They start working on their criticism of their friends, uh, the young Hegelians, published in a book called uh, The Holy Family. Um, then they get to work on a large sprawling manuscript. It turns out most of this book is on Max Stirner, a pseudonym for a friend of theirs who's very critical of the young Hegelians. That goes on for a very long part of this text. Um, Scholars who look at this text surmise that the section on Feuerbach was probably written last. I'm sure we'll come back to that. But what's important, I think, is that well, while Marx and Engels are writing The Holy Family, they travel to Manchester. Ma Marx, for the first time, really gets to see an industrial city. And it's in that context that he and Engels start to develop their critique and so on. We'll get to all that. That's published then or written then 1845-46 into this text, which again later in 1932 is given the title uh, The German Ideology. Lots of people have lots of ideas about this book. They say this is a big break between an early Marx and the later Marx or the mature Marx. I'm sure we'll get into that as well. Well, the publishers in 1846 didn't think much of it, they didn't publish it. And then when Marx comes to write um, the contribution to the critique of political economy in the preface of this text, he writes, I think humorously, a, a phrase or a sentence many people have heard. He says, we abandoned the manuscript to the gnawing criticism of the mice all the more willingly since we had achieved our main purpose, self-clarification. This is the text, they say, of self-clarification. Ajaz, why did you want to talk about the section on Feuerbach by itself? Why was that itself significant? For me, uh, because that is where a very synoptic statement of um, what became the theory of uh, historical materialism actually is um, produced. Uh, uh, in other words, there are a series of steps Marx has taken towards that, uh, towards uh, this. But this is this is a turning point because until then, in his, I mean, for Marx particularly, this is a whole process of coming to terms with his erstwhile philosophical conscience. Uh, uh, and he is developing his entirely new um, philosophy of history uh, in contestation with, first of all, with Hegel. With, and Feuerbach becomes a source of strength for him in terms of talking about idealism and materialism and so on. So there is a phase in which, short phase, in which there is a lot of Feuerbach in his writings. Uh, his early uh, statements on religion, for example, are uh, almost completely taken from Feuerbach. Uh, it is not uh, Marxist view of religion, it is Feuerbach view of religion and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's a critical view, but, um, but his own view, I think, is quite different. Uh, so for a while, it becomes a source of strength for him. And then he wants to become independent of that kind of ahistorical materialism, which is much closer to a very static kind of em em empiricism. 
Um, and um, so then he, had, he begins to develop a critique of Feuerbach in that, again, that little piece, um, 11 theses, as Engels called them. And uh, I mean, the story of it is that Engels found in his papers, uh, in Marx's papers, a sort of a, a couple of pages, uh, you know, sort of in which he's scribbling some thoughts. And uh, Engels saw it, that was very interesting and gave it the title Theses on Purebach and published in 1886 or something like that. Um, that, 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 is a, that is, I think, a text working towards what he says about Purebach. Now, in, the, in there, the epistemology the, of, uh, that governs those formulations of Feuerbach, central to that epistemology, is the idea of praxis. Uh, <clears throat> historical action to change the world, being the process through which you come to know the world. Knowing the world without acting upon it to change it um, is pure idealism. It is through acting in history and upon history. So praxis is the epistemology, the, uh, at the center of epistemology. But then he shifts very quickly uh, when he comes to German ideology, we had a central epistemological um, uh, category is production. Uh, and begins then uh, this whole idea of um, you know how history has actually progressed from the beginning uh, the history is it's really a history of production human beings producing themselves and producing their world and it is through changes in the modes of production starting from the first division of labor he says which is a sexual act uh, which then produces humanity. And the family is the first form of slavery in which a uh, male member of the family is the slave owner and, uh, uh, and uh, the wife and the children are slaves and so on. And uh, it's very interesting for me, by the way, that what the word slavery means to, uh, to Marx, it fundamentally means appropriation of other people's labor. Uh, so therefore, later he will talk of wage slavery, uh, <clears throat> etc. But anyway, that, that shift from praxis to production, a certain narrative of history, successive modes of production, uh, which gives, which again, it, it's again, he's still fighting Hegel, that it is not the spirit that advances from one stage to the higher stage to the higher stage and so on. And contradiction is not contradiction in, the, in thought. Contradiction in thought actually arises out of contradiction in actual society. Um, so he takes up the whole idea of progression in history through contradiction. But what is the contradiction? The contradiction between the forces of production and relations of production, and so on. So giving it, you know, what he elsewhere talks about, putting Hegel on, Hegelian dialectic on its, on its feet, inversion. Um, the inversion is from idealism to historical materialism, to historical materialism, not materialism and so on. And in that, he actually, in my view, uh, accepts many of the pre premises of, um, of idealism as we find it in Hegel, Kant, etc. So it seems to me that it's a, it's a text sort of in the progression of Marx's thought. It's a fairly um, central text before 
the before the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and here, what it seems to be very tentative, that um, narrative of modes of production, uh, again, gets very summarized and clarified. And again, even more synoptic version you find in the, in the manifesto. So it is, for one thing, it's a, it's, 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 it's a moment in the progression of Marx's thought. It is the moment in which not only the history of the modes of production is elaborated in that, this particular way, but the whole question of relationship between human practice and human consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> um, again, it is again dealing with Hegelian categories and so on. What is the relationship between being in existence, between material activity and thought? Before we get into the part about being and consciousness, which is so central to Marx and Engels in this text on Feuerbach, um, let's go back to a distinction you made, which I think is quite important. Uh, you made a distinction between idealism, you know, the tradition that comes from Hegel and that sort of leaks into the young Hegelians. You made a distinction between idealism. Then you said um, that Marx and Engels develop something that they will call historical materialism. And you said that that historical materialism is different from materialism as such. So could you just clarify, get idealism, could you clarify the distinction between historical materialism and materialism? Yeah, uh, let me first actually say something, uh, something uh, to preface uh, discussion of materialism. You see, German idealism, as you find it in Kant and Hegel in particular, is at the heart of it is the French Revolution. It's a reflection, a lot of it is a reflection on French Revolution. For example, his uh, Hegel's whole uh, treatise on his doctrine of, of right, for example, is, is, a, is, is a reflection on the declaration of rights of man and citizen, so on. And the, for Marx, the problem is that what is material and historical is apprehended in that thought in abstraction as philosophy, which means then that you are in the world of essences, you're not in the world of actual analysis of real movements of history and so on. But it is not that idealism has nothing to do with material history. It is that it inverts it into philosophical categories. Uh, so that's, that's one. And that is what is attractive for Marx about Hegel. And he, all his life, he kept saying all kinds of wonderful things, uh, how Hegel was one of his great masters and so on and so forth. He's always struggling with Hegel <clears throat> because of Hegel himself is, is struggling with the actual motions of history, which he comprehends in philosophical terms. So that, that's the quarrel with ideas. Uh, and that's at the center of the, the, the quarrel. What the materialism of people like Feuerbach does is that it recognizes the substantive nature of material reality, but it comprehends it ahistorically. Nature is nature. Social relations which are specific to the capitalist mode of production are human relations. So it does not understand that nature itself is historically produced. The nature as we know it, we do not know physical nature in the way and shape in which physical nature existed before human beings started acting upon it. 
and that na nature itself has a history. Social relations themselves have a history and they cannot be comprehended in, in a way that freezes them in, in a moment of history as if they were eternal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the fundamental category uh, is the historical production of all of these categories of matter itself. Matter is not independent of human action upon it. Uh, <clears throat> so it is giving, it is simply saying you are fighting abstractions with abstractions. He says somewhere, you know, you're fighting phrases with phrases. And when you say that earlier philosophy is wrong this way, that way, that way, you just want to replace them with other categories which are also speculative in nature. Uh, it is the historicizing of matter itself that I think is the fundamental distinction between uh, that kind of materialism uh, and Marxist understanding of materialism. I would go further and say that, you see, young Hegelians, whatever transformations that they made in the inherited philosophy, they also stuck in the terrain of his speculative philosophy. Marx is on his way out of speculative philosophy altogether. And by speculative philosophy, then what? Then that is what one means by philosophy in, in that period of time where philosophy is Hegel. Uh, he is, what Marx is producing is actually something uh, that Panibar, for example, says uh, he's producing an anti-philosophy. Uh, after these, you know, German ideology and um, holy family and, um, and texts of this kind, the texts that he produced before the communist revolution, he'll never again write a philosophical text. There will be enormous, enormous body of philosophical body of writing in the Grundrisse and Capital and so on, with philosophical implications. Mm -hmm. But he will never do philosophical categories. He, you know, for example, that chapter in Capital, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, on commodity fetishes, is the is the most brilliant, historically decisive um, sort of reflection on the category of consciousness in capitalist society, which would then generate history and class consciousness and so on and so forth. But that is not history in the Hegelian sense. That is not consciousness as philosophy understands consciousness. I think this is a good place to re reflect on the other two categories which you distinguished uh, earlier. You, you had talked about how there's a move from praxis to production. And I think this might be helped by what you just said about historical materialism. And of course, the historicizing of uh, different modes of production. Uh, and their relationship to the way in which people made and lived their world. So could you reflect a little bit on that uh, shift in thought between the centrality of praxis to the question of production? Um, yeah, you see cent centrality of praxis in Thesis and Feuerbach is first of all central category of epistemology. How do you understand the world around you? Do you understand it by reading more books? Do you understand it through logic? Do you, you know, speculative philosophy, categories of, how do you understand the world? And the category there is the category of praxis. Uh, <clears throat> You 
not only that you have to comprehend the world the world of objects as sensuous objects produced in human activity but you can understand you can understand the world only through praxis therefore that 11th thesis which is usually misunderstood that um, uh, philosophers have only understood the world the point is to change the world it's not that you don't need to understand the world in order to change it's quite the opposite which is that it is only in the act of changing the world that you understand the world so that's what i mean by praxis is epistemological uh it is by acting on the world that human beings actually understand the world uh, <clears throat> so but what is this world on which you are going to act that remains contentless it it is still being thought of in speculative generalizations Specu that language of speculative philosophy uh, it's still trapped there and by the time you get to german ideology and uh, and the writings that come thereafter uh <clears throat> germany ideology is also uh, you know it's not only that um, some publisher uh, did publish it uh, it is very much in the form of notes uh, it, it, it jumps from one paragraph to another and so on in order to summarize this thought that is racing through his brain much faster than they can actually comprehend the thought itself in my view uh <clears throat> so um so that, that that's what I, i would say that again production is again in terms of philosophy uh it is the epistemological category of production which makes the world intelligible creation of needs is the first historical act and history produces history progresses through production um of new needs and therefore systems of production to meet those new needs etc etc uh it's a it's a history history of human beings is a history of production um production itself is at its heart the act of human beings on nature uh external nature the relationship between internal nature and external nature is condensed in the act of production and so on and that what happens under capitalism is that that particular relation between internal nature and external nature is torn asunder so therefore human beings enter into a very different kind of alienation even from their own act of production they enter into as he says definitive social relations and those yeah. definitive social relations have a marked impact on how people can see the world and so on and then there are constraints um and this produces a set of almost aphoristic statements um you know which go from the german ideology out to a contribution to the critique the famous preface where again we have this you know uh, this theme about social being and social consciousness in um in the german ideology he says consciousness is therefore from the very beginning a social product um that's an interesting departure it seems to me from the hegelians and the young hegelians and a doorway into what i think we'll get to which is social being social consciousness could you say a few things about this idea of consciousness being a social product he puts it in in quite different ways consciousness is always practical consciousness practice is always both individual and social simultaneous um there's no such thing as production that is purely individual and if consciousness if production is itself not sim not sim never simply individual but social and collective 
then there's no such thing as a consciousness which is monadic in character. Where the individual separates himself out from the that he sometimes use the word collective, communal, different kinds of words uh, uses. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the if production itself can, is not individual, if and and if you, you if we understand production in that sense, not in the sense of you know manufacturing of this and manufacturing that. But the very, very way of human beings reproducing themselves um, through their action, uh, which is always cooperative and communal. Therefore, consciousness is the, the again, this is again refutation of the whole liberal tradition in which the locus of reason of rights, of consciousness, is the individual. Um, it is, again, a refutation of all of that, that neither rights, nor reason, nor consciousness is located in any one of us. It is, our consciousness comes out of the kind of collective world in which we live. Yes, because they spend a lot of time in the book going after Max Stirner, again, uh, a, a important figure of his day, forgotten now, who had published a book a few years before then called The Ego and Its Own. Right. And right. it sort That's of right. went from idealism to, in a way, individualism. Yeah. And this was a refutation of that, right. a considerable right. refutation. Yeah. So having established, let's say, that consciousness is both individual and social, I think that's an advance over people um, uh, around them who are making different kinds of arguments, then they will eventually end up at this very interesting um, idea, this very interesting set of ideas around the limits of consciousness and, and you know, social being and so on. It's not fully developed in the German ideology, it will be developed later. But I wonder if you could walk us a little ways into how they are thinking about consciousness and the limits of consciousness. In other words, that it's not the Hegelian spirit that produces um, historical advances, but it's something other than that. Uh, isn't that what they are struggling with, at least in this section called Feuerbach, where, where Mr. Ludwig Feuerbach doesn't make much of an appearance? Uh, he comes in, in abruptly in the text. You're quite right. It's it's like notes because they don't even introduce Feuerbach. He just sort of appears abruptly in the middle. He comes in parenthetically here and there. He's not a central character. They don't go through his work. There's no real critique of Feuerbach. That's reserved for Engels after Marx dies. You know, in the text where he prints the thesis on Feuerbach, that's his great book on Ludwig Feuerbach and on you know classical German philosophy, that's 1888. But here they don't actually sustain a critique of Feuerbach. Nonetheless, there is something here they're trying to suggest about, you know, I don't know what to call it, the motor of history. It's not the Geist, uh, the spirit that drives history forward. They, they seem to have, you know, started to work this out. What's the, what are the, the ways in which history advances? Yeah, but that, that is that is what I was saying, that in Hegel, it is not as if um, the, there is no reflection on the real world or explanation of the real world. In fact, it is a reflection on their own time. Uh, here, you know, that, 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 that's what I'm saying, that for them what drives history is, is production, relations of production, which are never individual. Um, there was some moment, prehistoric moment, pre-anthropological moment, when some, you know, there was some human being who assembled the first family. But uh, but that's an, for one thing an ideal moment. One imagines such a moment. But that human uh, existence has always been collective. It has, and the 
driving force in history is production and relations of production. Um, in here, in German ideology, there's a certain kind of, um, how do I put it? Consciousness seems to be a direct reflection of uh, social relations. Um, so there's a kind of reflection. Uh, what will develop in later Marxist theory, you referred to that preface, 1989 preface earlier, uh, in that preface, for example, what will develop in, in Marx then is a certain gap between economic determination and ideology, where he says that the, the economic science um, can be, in, economic factors in life can be determined but with the precision of uh, with a scientific precision. But it is in, in a, they name again, the whole range of politics, religion, arts, law, in short, in, in ideology, that human beings become conscious of their reality and fight it out. So there's a certain gap between reality and ideological comprehension to it, between economic factors, uh, the determination, the economic determination, and the ideological. That will come later in Marx. Uh, in this early text, there seems to be a direct reflection of economic factors, production, and consciousness. Certain sort of identity between uh, again, between being and, and existence, uh, <clears throat> between the material facts and the mental facts, intellectual facts, between consciousness and practice. There's a very interesting section, and I think we can we can put this in as our final thoughts. Uh, I'd like you to reflect on this because I've often found this um, both encouraging as an idea. And also, this is a door from at least the way I read the text on Feuerbach in 1845-46. Um, this is a door into most of Marx's subsequent work. Now, I'm personally don't believe that there's a need to have an early Marx, later Marx, and so on. Everybody develops in their thinking, and maybe there was there may, might have been a great break in in the thought and so on, but. I think a lot of this is a, an argument that's not that necessary. Nonetheless, there's a very interesting section where he talks about communism in the Feuerbach section. And I just want to read this sentence out um, because I think they're quite instructive. Um, they write, communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the present state of things. Now, of course, I'm tempted to keep going, but I just want to repeat these two sentences just for clarity. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the pre present state of things. Yeah, um, I think, I think <laughs> at one level it's really quite simple, but uh, he, Marx is struggling with the word communism since his, uh, the economic and philosophical manuscripts uh, to make it more and more con concrete. Uh, in his earlier texts, it is really not connected with any political project as such, which is related to the motions of history. Uh, <clears throat> in, you know, communism is the alternative to all this dreadful thing that, that exists. And that's it. Here, what is he's saying is precisely the logic that he has been 
following up to this point, that communism is not an ideal. It is not outside the motions of history. Communism is something that arises out of the motions of history. Uh, this motion of history that we have described as a history of modes of production of greater and greater human collectivity and more and more human control over both external nature and the forces of production that human beings themselves have produced through that. So human beings, so communism arises as a logical elaboration of a future that arises out of the contradictions of capitalism itself. Uh, this, this is what will come in the Communist Manifesto, um, that, that it is, the, it is the, the contradictions between relations of production and forces of production, which creates the very crises which need to for a general reorganization of the forces and relations of production, supersession of it. And communism arises out of that. Capitalism, uh, as they would say in the, in the manifesto, um, capitalism is, uh, is digging, is creating its own, uh, own grave diggers. So co communism is not something that, and again, this is, this is his, again, they're saying it is not by working out a, a plan. This is what good society would be like. Uh, it is not a question of educating people to the real thing that needs to be achieved. It is something that arises logically, historically, out of these motions of history. That's, that's essentially the, 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 uh, the, the, the movement here, uh, movement of thought. Um, and, and it is this thought that communism is actually the highest stage of product, of mode of production that you can, that, you, that history is tending towards, which should then, um, uh, you know, after the manifesto, particularly they begin more and more talking about the kind of political organizations you need, the kind of, um, and so on. So political practice comes out of that. What political practice would actually correspond to this real movement of history? Um, that's, I think, where they're going. I think this is a very interesting point because from this, of course, comes the period of the manifesto. And then as we move along, at least in these conversations, we're going to go next to um, Civil War in France, which is Marx's great text on the Paris Commune. Um, and so here we have it, you know, there's, um, there is this motion that tends towards um, the producers uh, having a greater and greater role in the construction of their own society and so on. Um, it, it actually flows very well that we leave the critique of Feuerbach and then what emerges is those grave diggers uh, that uh, stamped around the streets of Paris trying to create their own society 150 years ago. Uh, Ejaz, thanks a lot and we'll come back with Thank the you. civil war in France. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.